The family of a young Indigenous man who's in prison for murder is questioning whether he got a fair trial. Zach Grieve was sentenced to life in jail with 20 years non-parole under the Northern Territory's mandatory sentencing laws, a sentence the judge himself described as unjust. Now his family wants answers. It was an all-white jury. There was no Indigenous people in the sense of, um, yeah, it was just all white. Um, and I found and I seen, I seen, um, the trial went for six weeks. I seen where the, uh, there were three young people in the front uh, that was like they were playing, toying with Zach, Chris and Bronwyn. They were toying with us. As an Aboriginal woman, um, I really tr I grew the children up to not to see race because they're black and white, you know, parents. But uh, you, you can't sort of control what other people think. Now, reporter Stephen Schubert was working for the ABC in the small town of Catherine when the murder happened. He's now based in Alice Springs and joins us from there now. So, Stephen, what's the background of this case? Joe, the victim in this case was a man called Ray Nisiforo. He was fairly well known around town. His family um, set up a lot of the shops in Catherine. They owned quite a lot of property there. Now, he was engaged to a woman called Bronwyn Buttery. She um, had moved to Catherine to be with him and they were in a had been in a relationship for four years, but it was not a happy one. Bronwyn Buttery um, claimed that Ray Nisiforo was quite abusive towards her and it all came to a head one night when um, he apparently made threats against her life and threats uh, against the life of Bronwyn's son from a previous relationship, Chris Malishko. So Chris Malishko approached his mother and asked uh, if, if she wanted Ray um, to disappear, whether she wanted him to die. And Bronwyn Butter Buttery agreed to that proposition. She agreed to pay $15,000 to help make that happen. So the son, Chris Malishko, went, to, um, went out to his friends to try to get some help to organise this murder. And he approached a young man, Zach Grieve. Now, they also reached out to a third person, another friend, Darren Halfpenny. And so Zach claims he initially thought the plan was to beat up Ray. So what actually happened? Well, that's right. Zach has told me that he thought that Chris was asking him to help beat up Ray to try to scare him out of town. He said that he was uh, quite happy to be part of that. But slowly it began to dawn on him that um, Chris Malishko was not, in fact, planning um, a beating. He was planning a murder. Here's what Zach has said to me uh, from prison. Were you there when Ray died? No. Chris had taken me home about... I'm going, to, I'm going to guess to say about 15, 20 minutes before they'd done it because um, I'd said to him beforehand that, look, you know, I can't go through with this. And he looked frustrated, but, like, he didn't argue. He ended up taking me home. And so, Stephen, what evidence was there against that grief? Joe, most of the evidence against him came from the third person in this plot, Darren Halfpenny. Now, he started helping police with their inquiries uh, very early on in the investigation. But he also was proven in court to uh, have lied to the police about a number of, of things in his confession. For instance, it was his job to burn the clothes that the murderers were wearing um, after the act. Now, of course, they were covered in blood and he ended up burning them in a fire pit in his backyard. But he told police this convoluted story about burning them on a uh, World War II era airstrip that was near his house. And when police went out and had a look and couldn't find any fire or any remains, they went and asked him and he said, oh, I, could, I could take you straight there. And he later admitted that that was a complete fabrication. So for someone who's just confessed to a murder, it, it does seem like an odd detail to make up. There was other evidence against Zach Grief. There was a friend who claimed that after the body was found in Catherine, Zach Grief confessed that he was part of it to her. But the details that that friend claimed Zach gave to her were, were wrong. The details about where the body was found was wrong. And um, so there are questions over the reliability of that. And there were a whole heap of other circumstantial pieces of evidence. In fact, the judge himself said that most of the evidence was circumstantial. There was also some money that was splashed around by Zach Grieve shortly after the murder. The prosecution argued that this was uh, a sign that he'd received money. 
Zach Grieve had been seen buying a couple of new Xboxes, some new clothes and a $300 bong that was uh, 76 centimetres long. So um, all of this circ evidence, as the judge said, was largely circumstantial. Mm. And what about the sentences? So Zach Grieve was sentenced to life in prison with 20 years non-parole. Now, we don't know whether the jury found him guilty because they didn't believe him in his denials or whether it was because uh, they thought he didn't take reasonable steps to prevent the murder. Now, anyone can be convicted of murder if they fail to take reasonable steps. So we're not sure what was going through the jury's mind. But this is a sentence that the judge himself said was unjust. But Zach Grieve's case also stands out because of the sentences of his co-accused. Bronwyn Buttery, who admitted to paying $15,000 for the murder, stood trial for murder, but the jury found her guilty of manslaughter. She served four years in prison and was released two years ago. And Chris Malishko, the son who um, admitted to bludgeoning Rainey Sephora to death with a shifting spanner, he was sentenced to life in prison, and set, but only 18 years non-parole. So that's two years less than Zach Grieve, who the judge found wasn't there. And so where to next for Zach Grieve's family and supporters? As part of the sentencing, Justice Dean Mildred did recommend that Zach Grieve be considered for release after 12 years. But that's a political process. That would have to start with the Northern Territory Attorney General. And um, law and order is a hot button issue here in the Territory. So it is um, difficult to imagine any Attorney General, whoever it is in 2023, would be um, game enough to recommend that Zach Grieve be released. Now, Zach Grieve's mother, Glennis, has been campaigning tire tirelessly for his release, but also for a review and a change of these mandatory sentencing laws. I've also uh, spoken to Zach Grieve, but he is preparing mentally to do the full stretch in prison. The, the, the getting released after 12 years is a long shot, and he doesn't want to um, hold on to that hope when it could well prove to be false. OK, Stephen Schubert reporting there from Alice Springs, and you can read more about this story at abc.net.au slash news.